Good morning. Glad that you all could make it, and we apologize for some technical difficulties that uh, held us up. Please do me a huge favor. If you cannot see uh, something on your screen as we're going forward, if you see just a black box with no lettering or anything, and all you're hearing is me talking about something but not actually seeing what I'm referring to, please make sure that you contact the La Rosa office or put a question um, on, your, uh, on the screen here so that uh, someone can assist you with that. And most importantly, let me know so that we can figure out what the problem is. So good morning. We're going to talk about comparative market analysis. And I like to talk about this as I have on your screen right now. You should be seeing calculations made advantageous. Because I think that the CMA is one of those um, lost arts, shall we call it. Everybody says that they do a CMA, but in reality, what I find a lot of folks doing is allowing the MLS software to do what they're calling a CMA for them. And where this creates a problem is with pricing. Um, with pricing not only from your seller, but also from the buyer side. And I'm sure that some of you have been in situations in the past where you have uh, actually, you know, got, taken a buyer out to look at a house, and you sat there and kind of said after showing that property, I wonder how they came up with the price for that. So we want to talk about how do you come up with the price for that, and what is the correct price. So let's talk a little bit more in depth. What is the purpose of the CMA? To determine a listing price, also to determine an offer price. It is just my personal opinion and how I have always conducted myself in real estate that before my buyer puts an offer on a property, I do a CMA because I think that it's very important to know if the pricing on that home is accurate or not. We have too many times in our business when you think, you know, this is a great house, the buyer loves the house, the buyer makes an offer, they make the offer almost at list price and the problem is it comes back that the appraiser doesn't agree with you or the listing agent. If the listing agent had done a proper CMA, to start with, or if the buyer's representative had done a proper CMA to start with, then we would have found the, the disparity before there was an offer made. Because as you and I all know, it's all about the appraiser. They have a lot of power. So you have to make sure that you understand where they're coming up with their numbers, and not that you're going to do an appraisal but you should be able to do a CMA that comes in pretty close to what the appraised value of the house is so that you have some good information. And also, the last point, determine if you even want the listing or if your buyer is sincere. When you do the CMA and you come up with actual pricing and you can show where you've justified your pricing, I think that that is uh, something that you need to use as your determination then. Um, is this something that you really want to list? A lot of times after you've come up with the price based on what the folks still owe on the house, they're only going to walk away with $5,000 and they want to buy another home. Well, in today's market we know that that's not going to uh, work very well. So it helps you determine if this is a good business decision for you as well. I always I think this is the place to start when working through a CMA. And it is part of your listing process also. So I ask the seller what they think. I don't really care what value they give me. I just want to hear their reasoning. And those of you that have sat through the um, listing presentation webinars, or I should say present, or classroom presentations before, probably remember this. It's finding where the seller's mindset is. The seller is going to have an idea. Whether they say they do or not, they've got in their mind an idea of what they feel the value of their home is. It may be accurate and it may be completely off base. 
our job is to get a feel for where they're thinking and use it as a reality check if for nothing else. So let me give you an example of what I'm speaking about. Let's assume that you go out and you look at a property and the homeowner has called you and said, um, you know, we want to list our house, put it on the market for sale, we want to buy a newer home, we think we have some enough equity in it now that we can go ahead and move forward. So you pull up the property and uh, you pull together everything and you see that the value of this property based on doing a good CMA comes up to be $250,000. Your seller, however, on the phone when you said, well, what do you think the value of your property is? Told you that they felt absolutely certain that their home was worth $350,000. Now comes the critical part. Jot down the $350,000, but let them explain why they feel that it's worth $350,000, because that is the beautiful part about human nature. People will always give you their justification for their reasoning of something. So all you have to do is sit back and take notes. So they told you 350000 and they based it on a house that recently sold in their neighborhood that they consider to not be in as good a shape as their home. And because they feel they've made upgrades in their home that created a wealth of value that that other home did not have. Now, folks, you can know most upgrades unless they are more of a cosmetic nature. And here's how you can know that. If somebody has had to had any kind of improvements done that require a contractor to pull a permit, they will be on public records in the tax section. So you can know if they added a sunroom, if they had a new um, air AC system put in their house, if they had any kind of new wiring. All of these things require permits. And if there is no permit, but the work has been done, that's a whole other problem that we're going to talk about and deal with in a few moments. But you want to listen to what they say their improvements are. You can sit there and, if you want to call it fact-checking them, you can do that because you can pull all of that information from public records from the tax section that you can link to directly through MLS. So you need to look at all of that, but listen to what they say. When they're saying, we made improvements, what are the improvements? I'm going to refer you back, and for some of you this is a quick trip, others it's a little bit longer of a journey depending upon how long you've had your real estate license. But if you go back, way back to your pre-license class, you learned about the difference between price, cost, and value. And unfortunately, the seller will equate value with price and cost. So the seller says, I spent, let's say, $5,000 putting in something new in my house. Therefore, I added $5,000 worth of value to my home. No, they did not. It depends on what those things are. So what you've got to really spend some time doing is listening to what the seller has said at this stage. If the seller says, we put in new ceramic tile, but if every other home in that neighborhood has ceramic tile, and this particular house had ceramic tile when they purchased it, they just didn't like the color, so they switched it out for something else. They did not improve anything in the house. They just made it to their liking. That may or may not have made it more marketable. Let me give you other examples. People will say, I redid the bathroom, we added you know, $25,000 worth of value in this house. If the house was built in the 70s and had a 70s bathroom and they ripped it all out, they changed it all, they made it beautiful, they upgraded everything and they made it a 2016 bathroom, perhaps they added value. 
but probably not $25,000 worth. They made it more marketable. They didn't necessarily make it more valuable. The appraiser comes in, and here's the difference. The appraiser says, bathroom is functional. Check that one. That adds no value. I just want you to understand that what the consumer thinks adds value, and here's the, the one thing that you have to recognize. Most of these people that have decided they're going to put their house on the market and who have made improvements have watched HGTV or DIY Network, and because those shows say that if you make these upgrades with the Property Brothers or whoever, any of those other people that come in and do these things, and it's going to add all this value to your house, yeah, no, it doesn't really. Um, the other thing that they don't seem to equate is the cost of all the labor of those things on those shows. So you don't have apples being compared to apples here. So find out what they did. If they added new systems, if they added something important, if they took out something old, they took out the old um, Formica countertops and they put in nice, beautiful, new, uh, you know, some type of, of uh, either granite or higher end cabinetry and countertops, they've added value. If that costs them $25,000, the appraiser might give them five for it. So they have added some value, but maybe not what they're thinking. So point that I want you to understand very quickly about this is that cost, price, and value, again, just like you learned back in pre-license class, are not the same thing. When an appraiser looks at value added, look at longevity. Look at whatever it was that the homeowner did. Is that something that has to be replaced in the short term? Or is it something that's going to last for a long time? Again, another example just to try to make sure you understand the point. If you replace carpet with new carpet, there's no value added. The carpet is still going to wear out. If you replace carpet with ceramic tile, value has been added because that ceramic tile is going to stay there until somebody decides they want to change it. It's not going to wear and tear. It's going to be fine. Is the value added the cost of the ceramic tile? No. It is only going to be a percentage. Safe way for you to be able to look at this is if somebody says, I spent um, you know, X amount for this, usually I, I take, a, take about a third of whatever they spent, and that's what I say is probably the value that's been added. But it's not dollar for dollar. And unfortunately, your seller is going to think that that is. But pay attention to what they have done. Ask about it, landscaping improvements. Believe it or not, in Florida, we, um, we, we can add value in homes by just the landscaping. I mean, if you put in a $10,000 palm tree, it's going to add value to your property. So you do want to listen and listen to all of the things that they have done to the property, not just the house, but also ask about any landscaping, anything that they've done. Now, if they just planted a couple of trees that they bought at Lowe's and um, put them in the yard, no, that's not necessarily a lot of value added um, on landscaping. But pay attention, take notes, because you want to be able to look back at what they told you versus the information that you have come up with. Okay? So do your homework. Gather your information. Learn as much about the property as you can. Ask questions regarding the upgrade and recognize the upgrades that add value versus the ones that add marketability. Newer three things add marketability, but they don't necessarily add value. I love seeing things in MLS like newer, newer paint, newer this, newer that. All those are great. Those are marketing things. They make the house look new and fresh, and it tells the buyer they, you know, the, the seller cared about the home. They don't have a lot of things that they have to do prior to moving in. But 
to be perfectly honest with you, did any of those things add value? No. There's no value in, in painting. Um, so please make sure that you understand so that you can talk intelligently to your sellers. Then, I want you to gather all the sold properties for the past six months. And this is very important. Right at this stage, when you're doing the CMA, we don't care about what is currently on the market. We have to look at past history. Why? And you know this, but I know in the process of learning things to pass a test and then moving forward with getting the license, sometimes we forget a lot of the things that were very important. And this one was a very important one. You learned all of the different types of appraising that have to happen on any property. And you learned that on residential property that the most important one was the sales comparison approach. So that's what the appraiser is going to put the most weight on. And when they do that, this is where they start. They look at sold properties. They're going to look at properties that they can compare apples to apples. Okay, They want to take your subject property, the one that you're looking to come up with the price on, and you're going to look at, um, I just got a pop-up that we're experiencing network issues. Hopefully everything, everybody can hear me. Um, anyhow, I'm going to continue that we want to be able to look at ones in the same subdivision. An appraisal, appraising rule is that you cannot use property that is more than a mile away from the subject property unless you have um, some reasoning to do so. And the appraiser in their report would have to give uh, defined reasoning as to why they had to step out of that. So when you are doing your particular CMA, try to find properties that are in the same subdivision, that are in the same area, that are right there around this particular house that you don't have to change many things. You want to look at the same square footage. If you're looking at doing a CMA on a 2,000 square foot house, then look through your sold properties in that subdivision and the ones that are within 100 to 200 square feet of your size of the subject property are the ones that you should look at, at checking off. Look for ones that were built in the same year or within a year or two. Um, the big things to note you know, are if there were any major changes in um, construction. The same style. You want to make sure that you're comparing, again, this is apples to apples. So we don't compare a one-story home to a two-story home or a one-and-a-half-story home. If, you're, if the subject property, and the subject property is the one that you are looking to actually um, find the price of, when you are looking at that, you are going to say, okay, so I've got a one-story house. I need to find a one-story house. And that's what you should be looking at. So it's requiring you to go in and look at the pictures of the house and some of the information on the house. The same construction. Don't compare a house that is uh, cement block, you know, block walls, to a house that's framed. Don't compare a house that has a shingled roof to a house that has a tile roof. And I know I hear people saying, well, that's just the difference of the coating on them. That is not. A roof that is tile, the entire structure of the home is different because there's so much weight because of that tile that the, the, the roof structure of that home is much, much, much better because it has to be able to hold that amount of weight. So don't compare um, a tiled roof home to a shingled roof home because those are not the same things. So you have to look at everything um, when you're coming up with your comparables. Don't just choose the three closest ones. Uh, if you are in perhaps a subdivision where you've got a, uh, you know, a situation that we've got uh, 
a, a very just huge variances and, and maybe to think um, comparing things. If you're looking at doing a house in let's say celebration, um, most of your houses are similar construction, everything is going to be fairly easy for you to do that. Some of you, however, if you're doing a house out in let's say St. Cloud where you're a little bit more in the country and you have a house that was built in 2008 next door to a house that was built in 2088 or I mean 1988 now you've got a huge challenge so you're going to have to look at that and may I add one quick tip here if you've got a house that let's say is uh, on five acres thinking about maybe a house that's uh, out in, the, in more in the country um, up towards Claremont or something, you may need to actually get an appraiser to do the, you know, come up with an appraised value of the property instead of you even doing a, a CMA. Simply because there aren't comparables, there isn't anything, and you'd be trying to do too many calculations that really our license doesn't prepare us to do that. It would be best to just have the appraisal done on something. But everything else, let's try to come up with something that we can use. And the final bullet that I have down here is same amenities. Same amenities means that everything in this is, is comparable. We're comparing a house in a, in a subdivision that has, um, let's say, uh, a pool, uh, a, a community pool that has walking paths, that has uh, an HOA, and we couldn't find anything in that subdivision that was a comparable, but the neighborhood across the street is predominantly the same age, built within a year or two, and has all of those same amenities. So you want to be able to be looking at everything and making this, finding your comparables that have sold recently that are as similar to the home that you are trying to come up with a price on your subject property as you can. And you're going to, for the moment, disregard whatever the seller said that they felt the value of this home was. Because we are not gonna, going to worry about that. We're going to come up with pricing on this home and then we're going to go back and look at what the seller had actually said to us before that. All right, now continuing to gather our information on, our, on this, we want to go to our tax record. And I'm going to show you examples here in just a few moments. We're going to go to our tax records and we're going to pull the tax records for the subject property. Not so much that we just want to pull the, the tax records, but we want to look at the information that those tax records are going to provide for us. And then we're going to do that after we've filed at least three, or if you can find four good comparables, you're going to pull the same information on those. <coughs> Excuse me. When you do that, you're going to be looking for a couple of different things. You're going to be looking at the square footage. Now, this is very important, so I want to, want to go over this so that you can understand what it is that I'm, I'm saying. You have, on your tax records, you have the square footage of the property. If there is additional square footage, I want you to take note of that. And here's a very important reason why. If a house is 2,000 square feet, and the homeowner has added on a 12 by 12 uh, sunroom that they do have uh, condition, meaning that there's, a, there's an air conditioning vent that goes out there into that room. That may or may not be part of, that would be 144 additional square feet, but it may be listed not as, as 2,144 square feet, but it may be listed in public records on the tax information as 2,000 square feet and then additional square footage of 144. And let me explain what that means. When you look at that, and that is how it's listed, 
you cannot necessarily say that it is a 2,144 square foot home. The reason that it's listed separately is because the construction of that sunroom is not the same as the rest of the home. If the folks had, let's say, a cement block house, which most of us live in in Florida, <clears throat> the construction is cement block, which is the preferred construction for Florida, for our climate. And our climate not only being that we are predominantly hot, but also because we have this wonderful little thing in the ground called a termite. So building out of cement block means that we don't get as many termites in our walls as if we had built frame construction. So when they decided that they wanted to build the addition of this sunroom, and a lot of times this is born out of the fact that there was a screened-in porch, and now they've decided, well, we're just going to enclose that and make it an actual room. We'll get it insulated, and we'll enclose it. But they didn't build that room out of block. They built it out of frame, or they built it out of a, which would be wood, or they built it out of aluminum construction, metal construction. It's insulated. It's got a roof on it. It's got ductwork out there to provide the air conditioning in the room. So it's a room. But the difference is when an appraiser actually comes out to value that home, they're going to give the 2,000 square foot block section a value and then they're only going to give a portion of whatever the square footage amount is for the block home. Let's just say for the block home is $100 a square foot. When they look at that other additional 144 square feet, they're only going to give that $75 a square foot. Why? because it's not block construction. It's not as good construction as the rest of the home. It may be newer. The original house may, may have been built in 2006. They may have just put on that sunroom in the last two years, so in 2014. But they're not going to give it the same value because it's not the same construction. So it's very important for you to look at that. So if I take that thought process to the next level, Please make sure that you are looking at this properly. When you have people that have decided that they don't need their one-car garage and they have decided that they are going to turn that into a bedroom, they did not add that square footage unless when you pull it up in public records, it says that they made that as part of the square footage of the house. Because a lot of times folks do hire a contractor, pull a permit, that contractor will take the front where the garage door is, they'll make that an actual wall, it will be framed in, it will be insulated, everything will be brought up to code, and it will be made into a room. But just as frequently, the folks will hire somebody who says, if we leave the garage door there on the outside and I just create a wall on the inside, you don't have to pull a permit. You don't have to do anything. You can just leave it like this. And then if someday you decide that you want to tear it all down and use it as a garage again, then you can. When you have that situation, you, even though there is a bed there, even though that shows as a bedroom, when you are looking at it, you have to consider that a garage when you list that property. Because the value of, let's say, uh, a one-car garage is going to add <coughs> excuse me, 200 square feet into a house. So the difference of a 1,600 square foot house with a 200 square foot one-car garage is quite different than the value of an 1,800 square foot house. Does that make sense to everyone, I hope? So I cannot list this as an 1,800 square foot house if in fact it is a 1,600 square foot house with a one car garage. The garage does not have as much value as if that were a room. And you cannot consider it a room unless you can go on to public records and show that they have all the permitting done to make that 
room into an actual room and not a garage any longer. If it does not exist in public records that they pulled the proper permits and that this was done and that the tax records show that that 200 square feet is now part of the square footage of the property, please do not list it as anything other than a 1600 square foot house with a, two, with a one car garage. Uh, because remember, you have to make sure that you are getting facts. I know the folks are going to be unhappy, but that's what causes a problem whenever we get an offer and the appraiser comes out. I assure you, the, the appraiser is not listing that as an 1800 square foot house. They're listing it as a 1600 square foot house with a one car garage. And that's going to change value significantly. Um, so if your buyer offered to pay $1,000 below list price for that house and the appraiser comes in and values it $6,000 below what the list price was, that's all the more the bank is going to be looking at. And your homeowner is not buying an 1,800 square foot house. Your buyer is buying a 1,600 square foot house with a, two, with a one car garage. So please be careful um, of what you're doing and how you are, are handling some of these um, concerns that come up and that you're not creating a problem. So as my little screen says, let's crunch some numbers. Um, and I'm going to ask all of you to bear with me for the moment because we think we figured out how to change the application so that they show readily for you. but. Um, the key word in that statement was, we think we did. So let's, uh, let's hang on and make sure that we're looking at things properly. So let me pull up what I did as the subject property. And I just, I have pulled some things, and yes, I made them old, so we're not really looking at, um, at something that's current, but so that we could look at, at the information on it. And that's really what I wanted to be able to do. So looking at this and being able to just see, uh, this is what I'm going to use as our subject property. And I'm gonna, I've pulled tax records on this, and I'm going to show you those in, in just a moment. Zoom out, but... Okay. So I pulled the tax records, and I'll blow this up here so we can go kind of down through it where it look, it's showing us the information on this and it gives us all of the information, shows us our tax record, shows us what our square footage is, our year built, and let me just pull this so you can see this. Okay, I want you to see the year built the effective year built, meaning that there haven't been any improvements made. That's just a quick check for you to know when you're pulling up a subject property if you have year built and effective year built. If there were improvements that were made on the property that, let's say your home was built in 2000 or in 1980, I'll use that, and then in 2004 they made some major upgrades on it, it will show that right there. The living square footage is what you want to be looking at. You do not want to pay any attention to the total building square footage. I still see this happening. You know that there can be fines in MLS for this when it's caught. Um, and I know that the homeowner all the time wants you to list what the total building square footage is. But the total building square footage takes into consideration porches, the lanai, um, any, um, anything that's covered, you know, they've got a covered patio, um, the garage, it takes all of that into consideration. So just look at the, the discrepancy there. The actual living square footage of this house is 1991 and we bumped it up almost a thousand square feet with all of the other things that are just covered by roof. So we don't or and cannot actually um, do anything with that. So you want to be careful that you are pulling this information and that you are um, being accurate with whatever you have on this. It gives you all of the information and this is, again, you're just pulling the tax information on this. So you want to pull this up, just look at everything, see what there, what changes of, there are in this, 
Um, it'll show you all the property information, and it will show you if there were any, like I said, if there was anything pulled on this property, it will uh, give you that information. I pulled the information, all the tax information, on also on any of the comparables so that I can look at all of this information. And one of the things that it's going to show me on my comparables is the land value. Uh, I want you to understand that land value does become an important part of this. And let me give you an example why land value is so important for you to have a handle on, for you to understand what you need to do with it. There are going to be times when you are pulling up properties and um, I'll make you, maybe make this go the whole way back to when a subdivision was built out and the whole way through. When people are buying new construction, and some of you I know are working with properties that are new construction, they will have the buyer pay a premium for a lot. For whatever reason, the buyer assumes that if they are paying a lot premium, that that add automatically added value to their property. That is not true. That is just the builder is saying, if you really want this lot, you're going to have to pay $10,000 more for it. This one has a lot premium. And they usually say that's because of this, that, or something else. Folks, if you actually ask what the land value is, the land value for most new construction is the same. Unless you're in a neighborhood where you are buying a property and it borders on usually conservation area or more, mostly in Florida, golf courses. So here's the difference. Every single one of the lots in, let's say, a new construction golf course community is going to be a quarter acre lot. Every lot is valued, in this particular case, land value on this one is $23,000. So if I look at the land value as $23,000 and I say, all right, so my land is $23,000, let's say in a golf course community, that would be you know, fairly inexpensive, but we'll just use that for our example purposes. If that's the value of the house that's on a side street nowhere near the golf course in that community, then the land value of the house that actually backs up to the fifth T is probably not going to be $23,000. It may very well be $43,000. The homeowner, when they purchased the lot that backed up to the golf course, may have had to pay a lot premium of an additional $25,000. So they paid $68,000 for that lot. Their lot is worth $43,000. Hopefully this makes sense to you. The house that's over on the side street, their value of their lot is only $23,000. The two houses are exactly the same. Exactly the same. Both houses are the Wellington model. They're both four bedroom homes. They're both two story houses. One is a light gray color, the other one is a soft yellow color. They're the same house. So would they be great if one of those was our subject property and the other one was our comparable? If you're shaking your head yes right now, obviously I can't see you, but yes, that's the correct answer. So they would be great comparables. The difference is if we have the subject property is the one that's on the side street and the other one is the one, the comparable is the one backing up to the golf course that recently sold, we've got immediately a $20,000 discrepancy in price just because the land value. So it's very important for you in doing a CMA to pull up the tax records and see what the land value is because the appraiser is definitely going to look at that. 
the appraiser is going to look at the land value of the comparables that they are choosing and they're going to take that out of the equation. They're going to look at the house. They're going to look at the house and they're going to make adjustments on the house itself and they're going to pretend that they're setting that house on the land where your subject property is. So it's very important that you look at the value of the land of your comparables. And also, any of the amenities, does it have a pool? Does it have something different than your subject property? And pull all of that information out of it. But I just, I'm just kind of scanning down through these to show you that I pulled all of the information on all of them. Now in this particular case, our land value, because they're all in the same neighborhood, they're all very comparable, that you're going to see that values are pretty much the same. You're going to notice that we have the same land values and that we found properties that were very close to square footage um, on all of these and, and very close in, in everything, if you will. So I looked at all of this information and again, this is our subject property that we're going to talk about here for just a moment. And back to this and pull this up. This is a worksheet that I put together that you can have and you can do whatever you want to with it. You can make whatever changes that you want to in this. But this is this is a, a worksheet that I use and I'm going to blow it up just a little bit so you can see some of this um, a little bit easier. It's for you to be able to put the subject property information in what the uh, lot value is so you can subtract that from the sale price on the comparables because obviously we don't have a value for a subject property. Um, come up with this, this square footage so we can make an adjustment and the cost of this square footage, the bedrooms, the bathroom, the construction, just a place for you to write these things down to make sure again you're comparing apples to apples. I want to make sure that you understand what we're going to do. And I'm going to work through the examples here to show you how to do the adjustments in just a moment. But when you're doing this, this lot value is the land value. Okay? And we're going to take the whatever the sale price was of comparable one, we're going to subtract the lot value of it so that we are comparing the house, the actual building structure. And we're going to make any adjustments to that to our subject property. And once we make those adjustments, we would add the land value of our subject property back in because we want to make, take that house that was very similar to our particular subject property and we're going to compare as much, make adjustments, and then pretend that we're setting the house that just sold within the last six months on the same land that our subject property sits on because that's what an appraiser is going to do. And that's how they're going to come up with the value. I am not suggesting in any way that these are appraiser appraisals and I'm not suggesting that you have to become an appraiser and I'm sure that there's going to be some discrepancy between what the appraiser says and what you what the value you come up with. But the goal here is to get the value of your listing very much in line with where it can appraise and also whenever you are working on the buying side that you're working with your buyer and you're coming up with an offer and being able to validate where you've come up with a number for the offer to the listing agent based on being able to do a good CMA because I personally have run into a number of times whenever I have a buyer, I do my CMA, and I have a discrepancy of $25,000, $30,000 on my CMA versus what the listing agent has actually listed the house for. When I contact the listing agent, assuming, I always assume that I'm the one who's made the mistake. So I contact the listing agent and say, could you please share with me where your comparables came from for you to come up with the list price because I did my own CMA and I'm not coming up with this and I've, I've obviously done something wrong. So where are your comparables? Folks, I'm coming up upon my 31st year in this business 
And if I had a dollar for every time that I have done that and had a listing agent say, oh, well, I know the area. I don't do CMAs on these houses. Or, well, my, my seller has to get this amount of money for the house so that they can buy the house that they want to purchase. Do you see where I'm going with this? Folks, if I had money for all those times that I've heard that, I'd be a very wealthy woman. We probably wouldn't be having this class today. Um, because that happens a lot. And here's the downside. When that's your methodology, if we're in a great real estate market and things are just booming out of control and we've got all of the, the, you know, the sale price is just every day. We're having an increase and increase and increase. Well, then you don't have to worry about learning how to price properly because whatever price you stick on it, somebody's going to pay. But we're not in that market. We're in a real real estate market. And because we're in a real real estate market, the appraiser is going to go out there. And because of all of the discrepancies that have happened because we were in that booming market and that bubble burst, we have people that are actually going to have to do a really, really good job of doing an appraisal. And those houses that just have a number stuck on them, um, they don't appraise. And then we have to go back and we have to figure out how to get everybody to come to terms again. And I think that's what some of you are having happen right now. So we want to be very careful. If you price it properly, when you take the listing, you don't have to worry about it. If you're on the buying side and you do a proper CMA, you're going to come up with a, a, good, a good offer for the house. Um, and it's going to appraise out. So I want you to understand why we're talking about this and why it's so important that you understand where the appraiser is coming from. The appraiser has guidelines. We want to, we want to shout all kinds of things that they don't do things properly or that they, that they do this or they come up with this. And quite honestly, they're under so much scrutiny. They are under federal guidelines. You and I just have a license in the state of Florida and have freck watching. But the appraiser has the federal government scrutinizing everything that they do. And also, they have to answer to the mortgage lending um, system on everything that they do, or they're part of committing mortgage fraud. So I would not want to be an appraiser. I, and, and the funniest part of it is, they're the people that paid the least in the entire real estate process. Did you ever stop and think about that? They get paid the least amount of money, and they literally have so much liability in everything that they're doing. So we definitely want to give them some credit and understand what they're doing and where they're coming up with this pricing. And by doing that, we'll make our job a whole lot easier um, and be able to keep our customers happier, I think. So let me kind of take from that and get to um, the next thing that I'm going to attempt to show you here. Okay, so this is what we're looking at, and this is the first comparable, okay? And the first comparable sold for $239,000. The value, and I just put it in green here, are subject properties, land value was 23000 so the, sub, the, the comparables um, land value was 23000 which means our house value, and I want to make sure you're understanding this, I've subtracted that out, so our, our house value is $216,000. The square footage of our subject property, the living square footage, was 1,955 square feet. Our comparable number one is 1991, so it's it's bigger by 36 square feet. If I make an adjustment, and how am I making that adjustment? I'm simply taking the $216,000 because I took the land value out, dividing it by the 1991, and my cost per square foot is 108.49 and I'm making a negative adjustment of $3,906. So I'm literally taking this comp number one down to 1,955 square feet. Hopefully that makes sense to you. And I'm subtracting out $3,906 of 
the 216,000 to do so. Once I do that, I compare everything else. Our, our comp has three bedrooms. Our subject property has four. We don't need to make an adjustment for that only because we already did that in the square footage that we changed here. Okay, Block stucco. we got two car <coughs> garage. And I'm going to switch this over here. Um, the other thing is our comp has a pool. We go back into the neighborhood and pull up the houses that have sold in the last six months with a pool versus without, and we find that the pool difference is $15,000. So we make that adjustment as well because we don't have a pool. So if I make these adjustments, take that out, and put the value of the subject properties land, $23,000 back in, our adjusted sale price for comp number one is $220,094. Okay, if that makes everybody can see that. And again, this is being recorded, so you can go back and look, but that's, a, that's the difference. So we went from $239,000 to adjusted sale price of $220,094. Why? because we had to take out the square footage to get this down to the value of our subject property and we also had to take out the pool because our subject property does not have a pool. Okay, hopefully that makes sense to you. Let me go to comp 2. Okay, so comp 2 sold for $175,000. Take the land value out for it, and we have $152,000. It is the same square footage as our subject property, but it only sold for $77.75 a square foot. Everything else is exactly the same, and please keep in mind we are comparing comp two to the subject property, not to comp one. We don't care about comp one. Okay? But here's the other thing that we found. They were given $3,500 in closing costs. So we have to subtract that out as well. Because that, if they bump up the sale price on this property to be able to allow $3,500 in closing costs that came back to the buyer, then the seller didn't get that. So we now have an adjusted sale price on comp two of 171.5. Quite the, the difference. So just making sure that you see everything else was, was exactly the same except for those closing costs. So I took those out. <coughs> Excuse me. Three. Pull that in. Now you'll see comp three sold for 172.5. And we're going to take the value of the property out. We get our dollar amount. Everything is the same. Everything the whole way through. This one has a water view, however or at least that's what it says, but there was no value added for that. Now, let me just focus on this for just a moment. How do I know that there was no water, or no value added? Because if we had value added because this was a water view property, or because this was a property that um, backed up to water or something of that nature, and there was value added for it, it would be reflected in the on the tax information by giving this land value more. There is a huge difference, and you all need to learn to look at that in public records. In I keep saying public records, but tax records, same thing. When you pull up property and you're seeing that a real estate licensee has written that it is water view or that there is some, some type of value added because of that, if the taxing authority 
the municipality, the county, has said that this land is worth more because it is a waterfront property, then this number, the land value, will reflect that. If this is if this is the same as it is the entire way through, stating this in MLS was nothing more than a marketing feature. There was no value given at all. And I want you to see that. Because when you are pulling up comps or whenever you are pulling up properties um, and looking at this, if there is value given because it backs up to the golf course, because it it has, um, you know, it's by a pond or it's by a waterfront or something like that, it will clearly state that in the tax records. It will clearly state that. Putting that into MLS simply means that somebody's used it for marketing and you all know that there are fines in MLS that if you put in that it's a waterfront property and it's really not, then you can be fined for that. Do I still see it? Yes, I want in my neighborhood right now. The house is um, on a side street that and, and the side street goes back approximately you know half a mile, about five houses in, there is a sign in front of a house that says waterfront property. In order to get to waterfront, you would have to walk to the end of the street, cross, the street that is that is um, perpendicular to that one, go through the yard of the people whose house actually does back up to the lake in our neighborhood. But that house is not lakefront property. Um, but that is the little sign that it has in front of it. So there, are, um, you know, I, I know it happens. I see it myself. You know it happens. But we know that as a La Rosa realtor, you are above the rest of the folks. So that's what you need to keep in mind. Do your job. Do your job well. Represent your company well. It all works out for you. So be careful on some of the things. But there is a way for you to look and see and for you to know if there's additional value given just because of that. And if not, there, you know, if it doesn't state that and if the value doesn't, doesn't change, you um, you can ass be assured that the appraiser is not going to be giving any additional value as well. So here's our discrepancy, folks. We have a property that said that it was 220000 and we have these two that are almost exactly the same as our subject property. And you can see the difference in what was paid, most importantly, the adjusted sale price. So if we were putting this house on the market just by doing this, unless our subject property we can show there's something truly amazingly different which we really didn't see, our house should be listed right around 172.5 not 220,000. But now comes the fun part. Let me go back to this and show you something. Here's what I did. I used what I see most people using, which is going into MLS clicking on some comparables when you run this little program called the MLS CMA and pulling this up. And when you do that, you pull up this. And it's 26 pages. It looks really cool, doesn't it? It gives you all this information and it looks really, really nice. And it pulls up this. And it shows you that 
the averages, and this is what I see to, to look and see what people are, are coming up with. They're coming up with values for properties. I hope that you can see this. I'm just going to scan down through because these are no adjustments have been made. I am showing you how this just printed out from MLS, just the way it is, no changes, no anything. And you can see listing price, what it's suggesting on here, what it pulled up, all the information that was used to come up with this. And I'm just scanning down through here so that you can see. Again, you can you can view this in detail, um, but for our purposes today, I'm just scanning down through this so that you can kind of see all of the information that it came up with of what it's showing on these different properties because no adjustments were made. Obviously, this is how it just is going to pull everything out. But the bottom line of what it's going to say for pricing recommendation and activity on the market, and it gives us all these guarantees of what it is that we should do, and it looks really kind of cool. And especially whenever you're looking at some of this information where it's telling you that you shouldn't overprice and how the percentage of buyers are going to look at everything. And you've all heard me tell you that a million times in some of the other classes. It gives you the breakdown of where the commission goes. So you can pull a lot of great information from this and use in your listing presentation. Um, and it talks about you know showing the property and everything else. But here's the problem that this actually shows this consumer. It's going to show them, I go back here where our, our price point is, that the house should be probably listed somewhere. The average sell price is what it's saying and the median of 187 to 196. Where do you think my seller is going to suggest that we list this house? Some of you are saying that they're going to say, well, they're going to probably say, well, that, that, if that's the case, I should have my house listed somewhere around 196.5. But when we did the comparables, the comparables told us that when we did the adjustments, it's at 172.5. Do we see the problem? Because if I list this house for 196.5 and I put it on the market for that and I get buyers coming out, even if I have somebody that loves it and they put the offer in on it, what are the chances of on this little house that the appraiser is going to give my buyer an additional almost $25,000 to buy this house? I don't think that that's going to happen. So it's very important that we look at this. I understand what the consumer wants. I understand that you want to make your sellers happy. But I also understand that in this market, whenever I actually hold the comps, that this was where we need to be. I would grant you that my buyer would be much happier if we were going and I were doing this for a buyer and I say we're going to offer what, you know, I suggest that based on the comps you offer somewhere around 172, but if the listing agent priced it somewhere closer to this, they're going to say that was a low ball offer. And the reality of it is, no it wasn't. It was an accurate offer based on the information that we were able to pull from houses that recently sold. Why did one sell up here? I don't know. And there's the problem that we have sometimes with the information in MLS is because while I had accurate information that clearly showed that one of them received $3,500 in closing costs, I have no idea if this person received money back for closing costs or not. 
my guess is that they did. My guess is that they put a lot more money down on the house because they really, really liked it. And so their financing was able to go through. But when you close out a listing, I want you to think about this, please, for the future. Make sure that when you're closing out your listings that all of the information is very accurate so that it can be pulled properly. Appraisers a lot of times will throw out using a house as a comparable simply because they know there's such a, disparage, a, a, a disparity with the um, information on that particular house and everything else that they can find as a comp that there had to be something different about that house, but they have no information and they try to call the listing agent to find out if they can't get a hold of them, they'll throw that out. But just know that you are looking at some, uh, some different things you know, on this and there's always the ability to go back and look at this information by simply pulling the tax records and looking through those. You don't have to pour through them. If you're not comfortable on how to use them, because every county has things a little bit differently, but typically you can go to the county, um, most of them, especially now that we're getting back into a good solid real estate market, are holding classes at the county level that you can go in and they will show you how to use the property appraiser's website and how to pull all the information. They usually hold these. It's a free class. I strongly suggest that you um, go there and find out as much information as you possibly can about how to use the county or counties that you work the most in, uh, because some of you are going to be in various different counties, but find out how to use their property appraiser's website to pull this information. For us as realtors, that's very important information. Um, I'm going to just, you know, touch on a few things here that I, I want to reiterate to make sure, while not reflected in what I showed you, but that I think are very important things that you need to make sure you're looking at when you're pulling comps. And also, when you are looking at your subject property. So let me just go back to... <clears throat> I want to remind you of a couple of things um, that I spoke about a few moments ago on the, these tax records. When you pull up the tax records, please make sure that you are looking at the information. Sorry, direction, um, that you are looking at the information on the tax records that is going to show you. Let's start at the subject property. Pull that information first from the tax records. And the first thing I want you to look at is who owns the property. This is very important. This is not just for a CMA. This is for you taking the listing. So it's just a reminder moment. But please make sure that you pull that up and you see who owns the property. Because if you have the folks that called you, you know, you, you've got Mr. and Mrs. Seller have contacted you and asked you to list their home for sale. And you pull up public records and you see that the home is not owned by Mr. and Mrs. Seller. In public records, it says that it is owned by Miss Seller, but with a different last name. What that means is the husband, the current husband, has no ownership in that property. Or if you notice that, let's say your seller's names are Jill and Jack, and you notice that the house is owned by Jill and Henry with a different last name. What that should immediately tell you is stop, go no further, because Jill apparently got this house awarded to her in a divorce settlement, but the paperwork of the deed, the quitclaim deed, never got put through. 
So it's showing that the house is still owned by the ex-husband and her. Don't take a listing which she and the new husband are signing off on because if you do that, you have committed fraud. Okay, they do not own the property. She may own the property, but somewhere there's a quick claim deed that either has to quickly get recorded or if they haven't recorded the quick claim deed, then you have to go back to the ex-husband and he has to agree to list the house. I have funny, funny stories that I can tell you over the years um, that are kind of those train wreck ones where you can't take your eyes off of it, but, um, but yet you're not really believing what you're seeing. I think the worst one that I ever had happen that the listing agent, it was an exclusive property, the listing agent was contacted by the, um, by the husband of this couple who um, explained that he was going to be out of town for the next couple of weeks that um, their marriage was ending and that he wanted to get the house on the market for sale. The listing agent was so excited about the fact that she was getting this listing on this exclusive property that she went ahead over, he signed the listing agreement, she put it on the market and um, put the sign out in front. The soon-to-be ex-wife had already moved out but of course still had friends in the neighborhood and when she was informed that the house went on the market um, by one of her neighborhood friends she apparently called her soon-to-be ex-husband and said so I hear you put the house on the market and he said yep I figured we just list it sell everything and split it 50-50 ladies and gentlemen let me explain to you that I was sitting in the office when one of our sales associates had shown that property, I will never, never to the, to, to, for the end of my life forget the look on this woman's face when she came to the office and shared her story. She was still ghostly colored. <clears throat> she had called the police because she took buyers into the house and the house was destroyed and she called the police only to find out that it was not vandals that had done anything to the house, but it was, in fact, the soon-to-be ex-wife. Apparently, the comment that they would split everything 50-50 did not go over well, and um, she decided to do that on her own. When the sales associate from our office walked into this house with the buyers in tow, she walked into a grand piano that had been chainsawed down the middle, sofas that had been chainsawed down the middle, um, the, she, a lawnmower had been taken to any carpeting that was in the house, it was destroyed. Apparently the thought process was that 50% of nothing was still nothing. I can hear some of you laughing. I really can't, even though you're on mute, I can hear you laughing. Others going, oh my goodness. Um, but the worst part of this was the real estate licensee who took that listing got into a lot of trouble because she did not have the wife's signature on the listing and the house was clearly owned by both of them, not by just the husband. Um, so there was a big, big mess on all of that. That's why I told you the story. Make sure you know who owns the house. Make sure you get the information. Okay. Make sure next point is what is the square footage of the house? If they are telling you that there's additional square footage, did they get permits for it? I'm going to go back to my example of the sunroom. If they're telling you there is a you know, 200 additional square foot sunroom on that house, but when you're pulling up public records, there's nothing showing that a permit was pulled. It's showing that there's a 2,000 square foot house. No sunroom. They obviously did not pull permits for that. That is going to create a big problem when you take this listing because that's going to be what the appraiser is going to see as well. <clears throat> and if we do not have permits pulled for that, that sunroom, now we have to show was that sunroom built to code? And it's going to depend on 
the local um, code official as to whether they are going to allow that room to stand as a room and be okay with that and, and sign off on it or if they are going to cause your, the seller to go through a lot to get that permitted or if they're just going to cause it to be torn down because the only thing that there was ever a permit pulled for was a wooden deck and wooden deck is not permissible by code, uh, building code, as a substructure for a, a room. So you're going to want to look at that before you list the property because it will create a problem once the property is listed and if you get an offer, um, you know, there, there can be a lot of, of concerns with that. So please make sure that you look at all of these things so that as you move forward, you have an idea if all of this is correct, if everything, if you're listing it with the correct person, you don't have any problems. If you're listing it, let me go back to that for just a moment. If you're listing it with somebody and they say they have permission to list it, then you need to make sure that you have the documentation with their power of attorney. You all work with title companies. It is my strong suggestion that you give that to the title company and ask them if it is going to be enough for them to um, move forward with closing. There's a huge difference if someone gives a power of attorney to list a property versus does the person who the power of attorney was given to have the ability to actually close. When you're closing, remember you're signing off on any liens on that property and that's quite a big difference than being allowed to just list it. So. You want to find out, take that to the, to the title company, get them to have it run past their attorney and um, make sure that all of that's going to be okay for you to be able to, to move forward with that. Um, I just want to make it, again, as easy for you to do, but also it's important. So collect your data, get all of your information, do your CMA. The next piece of this is, once we have what we think is our correct pricing, now we do want to pull what active and pending listings are in the neighborhood. Why do we want this information? Well, that is our competition. And nothing will help your seller see where correct pricing is going to help them or hurt them than those pending and active listings because, especially the active ones, if you have a house that's been on the market and they're saying, remember back when we asked them what the price of their house should be and we came in around 250000 but they said 350000 so they were only $100,000 off, that may be because of how the houses are listed in their neighborhood. And I can give you another real life example. I have a, had a friend of mine who contacted me and needed to get their home on the market to, uh, to sell. She said, there are three other homes, and these were big estate properties. There are three other homes in my neighborhood, so to speak, that are on the market. One was listed for one point million, one was listed for 1.2 million, the other one was listed right at a million, actually I think at 9, 9.99. And uh, the 1.3 million dollar house had been on the market for only <clears throat> four months at that time. The 1.2 million dollar house had been on the market for over a year and the 9.99 had been on the market for 10 months. So when I looked at that and I looked at her property, and of course there were not a lot of comparables, I quickly said, we need to look at what you need to get out of your house because my intuition told me these houses were all listed way too high. The other comment was, we need to contact an appraiser simply because I'm not an appraiser but I also don't have any comparables to pull. All of the comparables of homes that had sold were not estate homes. So to make my very long story short, we got an appraiser involved. The appraiser came up with the value of the property as 885. 
I brought that to my sellers. Again, these were personal friends. So I brought this to my sellers who went, whoa, that's a big difference from 1.3 million. But I said, yes, that is a huge difference. But here's the question. How quickly do you want to sell your house? Because if we use the 885, it's going to appraise at that. We can market the property as we're selling it at appraised value. Well, we crunched the numbers, everything worked. They had some extenuating circumstances for the reasoning why they needed to sell the house. So we moved forward with the sale of the house at 885 and marketed at appraised value. Now here's the interesting part for you to recognize. I sold the house in 32 days. Let me remind you, we had a house on the market for four months, one for nine months, I mean 10 months I believe, and one for over a year. We sold their house in 32 days. It was a lovely commission on 885 and the other part was all three of the other sellers contacted me immediately wanting to know if I could list their homes for sale. Of course, I could not. They were under contract. But one of them, the one that was over a year, when that one was up, that particular seller did contact me back and said, could you tell me how much my house will be valued at? I said, ma'am, just get an appraised value. I'd like to share with you that that house that would have been listed for $1.2 million was then sold for $925,000 and also was sold within 40 days. Um, there's the difference, folks. Okay, Show these people. The, the people that had their house listed for $1.2 million were happy to drop the price and get their home sold. I want you to recognize we have to deal with emotions and you are going to have sellers who say I don't care what you tell me somewhere out there is somebody who's going to who's going to buy my house for the price that I want and that's probably true they may have to wait five years for that to happen and you're going to have to make a decision as to whether you can afford to market the property for that amount of time or if you're okay with that if you say yes okay Otherwise, it's not a smart business decision for you and let somebody else deal with that. Move on to the listings where people are going to be realistic about the pricing. Normally, whenever I have a seller who says, I see what you came up with, but I still, you know, you're selling me my house is only worth $250,000 and I feel my house is worth $350,000 and I know that there's a realtor who will list it for $350,000. I usually look at that person and say, you're absolutely correct. I'm sure there is a realtor that will list it for $350,000. However, because all of my information shows me it should only be at two fifty, dollars because I also know that listing a house even 10% above what my CMA comes in drops the amount of buyers that will be coming to your house by 50%, and <clears throat> because I also know that the majority of buyers have to get financing and that the financing is based on the appraised value, I still feel that $250,000 is the value of your home. But I wish you luck. Because in my opinion, it's not a smart business decision to take a listing that is that somebody wants me to overvalue to that point, where I can clearly see there's no appraised value. So those are decisions that you will personally have to, to make um, and make determinations of your own as to how you're going to handle them. But um, you know, keep in mind that you need to pull the competition. You need to show them what their competition is. If you show them that houses are staying on the market and not selling because they're overpriced, that's very important. That's what you want to make sure that they get from that. <laughs> if you are presenting this and your seller's guesstimate, I know I have estimate up there, but I'm going to say guesstimate, was inaccurate, how do you present that? Because that's another touchy subject. So 
They told me $350,000. They told me that it was based on the fact that they made these great improvements in their home um, because they know that they took care of their home better than that person and that that person's house sold for $300,000. So let's start there. When I pull comps, I usually pull the comps based on what is going to be the best for my subject property. And I usually found that in a discrepancy where the homeowner has told me their house is worth three hundred fifty thousand, and I'm showing that it's only worth two fifty, that that house that they based all of their reasoning wasn't even a house that was a comparable. So I'm going to pull that house that recently sold, so that whenever I go in to do my listing presentation to this seller, I have it as part of it. And I usually start with something of the nature of, when we spoke, you told me that you felt that your home should be listed at $350,000. And the reason that you based that on was because the home two blocks over recently sold for $300,000. I'm not sure where you got that information from because when I pulled that house, it showed that it had been listed for $299.9, but it actually recently sold for $275. And in addition to selling for $275, it shows that the seller gave $5,000 towards the buyer's closing cost. So in essence, it sold for $270. The other reason that um, there's a little bit of a discrepancy between the value I came up with with your home and that property is you may not have realized but that house is actually uh, about 400 square feet larger than your home while you have added some improvements to your home that make your home more marketable, more sellable um, and some things that have added some value but the difference in size um, is a value point on that home as well. So there's a huge discrepancy of $20,000 between that house and yours. Here are the comparables that I've pulled that are very similar to your home that have recently sold. And let's go through those so I can explain to you why I think the value that we should put your home on the market for is in the price range of $250,000 to $255,000. And let's discuss that. So you need to have your reasoning and your justification of why. You know, why is it? Why is it not um, a good comparable? Sometimes it may be a good comparable. I mean, they may, they may be spot on with uh, the home that they're using for justification. I don't want to say that always your seller is, uh, you know, not going to be spot on. I mean, they may have told you, should be at three hundred fifty thousand because this house sold for three hundred thousand. You may pull that house up. It did sell for three hundred thousand. Your homeowner has made some great improvements. Maybe not fifty thousand dollars worth, but it, but the comps are going to justify that your your seller should list their house for three twenty five. So they were only twenty five thousand dollars off. And you know I've had some sellers that are really spot on with where they think that their um, their numbers are and and where their house should be listed. So. I, I don't want it to always be that your seller is not going to be accurate, but I guess I'm always going at the worst case scenario whenever we're, we're talking about some of these things in class because I want you to be able to handle the, uh, the, the not so great situation. How do you handle their objections? How do you overcome some of the, the situations that are presented to you? If everything goes perfect, I'm pretty sure you can deal with that. So I want you to deal with the not quite so perfect situations. So um, you know, be be prepared to look at all of this information. I understand some of you, you know, you're saying, "Well, I do my I'm coming up with the price and I go out there and meet with these people." Please do your homework prior to when somebody calls you to say they want you to come in to do a listing presentation. Then do your homework before you get there know what this house has, pull that information. Um, again, I've certainly been in situations where I've pulled information and I see what the footprint of the house is, I, I've 
pulled some comps. I have a pretty good idea where everything should come in. I walk into the house and um, the example that I gave you of the 200 square foot sunroom is a, is a realistic one. I pulled all the information on the house and there was no sunroom. And I went there and the folks said, oh, well, the biggest thing is we added this great sunroom onto the back of this house and we just love it and we think that buyers are going to love it too. And I'm standing there going, I'm pretty sure buyers would love this. The problem is the code official is not because you didn't pull a permit. And the lady looked at me and said, oh, did we have to pull a permit for this? Yeah, pretty much any time that you're dealing with anything like, you know, wiring, construction, because things could fall down and smoosh people. Any permits for that, you need to know that it was built to code. People don't do it because they're trying to do something underhanded. I firmly believe they just really don't know that they were supposed to do it. There's maybe one or two out there that are trying trying to pull something underhanded, but for the most, people just don't understand that they were supposed to do this. Or the other thing is they're afraid it's going to cause their taxes to go up so high. But the reality of it is it probably isn't going to change their taxes or their, you know, so much, but also they have not have it insured. It's not even part of the building structure according to their insurance because they don't have a permit pulled for it. So all of those things are probably more important um, for them to realize than they were afraid to make their taxes go up or they just didn't realize that they needed to have um, anything done. So again, look at all of those things. Be realistic on what you're looking at. And, you know, when you're trying to come up with what's the value added for things, please don't take your seller's determination. Do a little due diligence on your own part. You know, my, my joke is always take an appraiser to lunch, but, I, you know, while I'm joking on that, it's not a bad idea. You know, talk to an appraiser. They are the ones that come up with the values on these things, and values will change according to neighborhoods. Um, you know, you, if you put a, put a, a fence around a, a property uh, all bought at the same Home Depot, the value that that fence adds to a house that you're that, that it's around in Winter Park versus the one that it's in Winter Garden are two completely different amounts of money. The fence costs the same thing at the Home Depot, but the value it adds is based on the neighborhood that it's been added into. So an appraiser can really give you some good you know definition on how to look at that and how to add value or what doesn't add value? One of the things that I constantly um, am, you know, having to work with appraisers on because of what I do a lot with energy efficiency is what's the value that's added whenever they add in windows? Well, it depends because what did they add? Did they just put in a replacement window? Did they put in something that's energy efficient? And when we're looking at energy efficiency, I'm going to tell you right now that that is based on the cost savings. So um, appraisers are learning how to deal with that right now, and and there are cost savings being added for um, all of the different energy efficient features. Why am I sharing that with you? Just so you understand why I'm sharing that with you on the CMA, because as we move forward, especially into 2017 you're going to see a green appraisal addendum coming out on a lot of houses. The new construction has brought this um, into the forefront. Most of the new construction is because of building code is having to um, add a lot of energy saving features into homes because building code requires it. Building code in Florida that recently changed and that uh, changed July 1st. So you are just having homes that were permitted for new construction over the past month or so are going to have a lot of different energy saving features on them over the next couple months as they are built prior to any homes that were built before that. And with that you're going to have a green appraisal addendum which clearly shows a savings on that house based on features that that home was built with. 
Um, that as a real estate licensee is something that you should become more knowledgeable about because it will factor into this whole CMA. Um, it's new construction, so obviously the appraisal is going to be done with that factor into it. But what you're going to see is as people are making those upgrades on their existing homes, uh, that green appraisal addendum is going to be used on those as well. So um, standard uh, heating and air conditioning systems are currently required by code to be 14 SEER, but when you upgrade those to a 16, an 18, or a 21, there's going to be a value added to that home because the, um, the actual savings for the heating and air conditioning, which is the biggest cost for energy um, in any home, is going to be greatly reduced, probably less than half of what it is on an existing home. That's, that's a huge difference. I mean, we're talking about somebody's utility bill um, being $200 a month, and just because of the HVAC system, it's going to be less than $100. Um, that's, that's a big savings. That's going to add value into that property, and it will change um, how the mortgage lending system is viewing this, and now they're going to be giving lesser, um, taking uh, like maybe a half a point off of the interest or allowing the buyer to buy more home because of the energy savings. So it's going to be a huge thing. You're going to see it first in new construction, but then it is going to be moving forward with existing construction. So I want you to be aware of that because appraisers um, are being beat up by this. Um, right now I've been to like five different seminars on this um, just because of the appraisers are having to learn all of this and be able to make adjustments. So pay attention to that. If people are telling you they have energy saving or green features on their home, there is documentation. Ask for their HERS, H-E-R-S, HERS rating. It stands for Home Energy Rating Score. So H-E-R-S is what they should have. If they don't have that and if they're just telling you that, then tell them you have to get further documentation. Um, those of you that need to have a HERS score done for a, a listing that has energy efficient upgrades, um, please contact the Florida Solar Energy Center. They are over in uh, Brevard County in Cocoa, but um, if you just Google Florida Solar Energy Center, you will be able to uh, reach them. They are the folks that um, oversee all energy raters in the state of Florida so they can put you in touch with somebody that can help you out and give you good information on all of this. But be aware of it. Um, it's very important and it's going to, like I said, for those of you dealing with new construction, um, it will be part of your appraisal and, uh, and part of the, the whole CMA process for you. Okay, so putting it all together and finishing up your your um, presentation this morning, WIFM principle. And some of you that have taken other classes with me, you know that I talk about this all the time. WIFM principle stands for WIIFM stands for what's in it for me. That's what the seller wants to hear. That's what the seller needs to know. They need to get the listing price and be justified so they know what's important. The big reason why we're doing the CMA, whether we are doing it for the seller for the listing or whether we're doing it for a buyer when they make an offer, is simply so that we know that the value is going to fall in line with what the appraisal is going to come back with. That's the important thing. Correct pricing will bring 60% of all qualified buyers. If we overprice by 10%, that number drops to half. Do you have something that will show this graphically? Yes. Remember that CMA that I showed you that I just pulled in off of MLS? It was right in there. It was right in there. You have graphics that you can pull showing these exact things off of realtor.org, not .com, .org. That's, that's M, the uh, NAR's website is realtor.org. You have graphics, you can pull that off of there. You can pull it off of FAR's website. Um, but show this in your listing presentation, why it's so important to list the house 
at the correct price. And you know, when we're dealing with the buyer, the buyer is happy when they're paying the right price. But it's all about making sure we do the CMA so it can appraise at that and why it's justified that we do so. Show your comparables, explain your adjustments, explain why you use sold properties to come up with your adjustments because those are ones that people paid real money for that were able to be appraised out for that amount of money and that's why we use those. And explain why you didn't use the pendings or the actives as your comparables and the reason for that is because we don't know what those ones are going to sell for. We're going to go with actual sold properties because that's what we know someone paid. And that's why we use those as our comparables. The other ones are just our competition. And we want to use those as our competition to show that as our competitors, if they're not priced properly, that's why they've been on the market for 220 days and the average days on the market right now is only 60. So you want to show those things. Show your knowledge. Use the CMA. It's not difficult to do. If I can learn to do a good CMA, you are great intelligent people, you can do this and you can probably do it way better than me. So use it as your ability to build your own confidence and show that you know how to do this and also to show your competence as that you're the reason that you know they are working with you, you know what you're doing, you're the professional in real estate, they're the professional in their job, this is what you do and you can do a great job for them. Every customer you have that you show that you are a true professional and you can do your job well, they're going to go and tell five more people about how great you were. And that's five pieces of business that come to you as opposed to you having to look for. So always keep that in mind. I know that um, all of you want to do the best for the current customer, but you're also looking for additional business. So um, use your current customer is your opportunity for additional business every time you're talking to them. And that is it folks. I have gone through all of this. This was recorded. You will have all of this. I will send the worksheet um, in a file uh, so that it can be uploaded to Resio so that any of you that want to use it can download it. And again, make whatever changes to it that you want to, it's just a starting place for you, but that way you can have a worksheet to, to use and I will send that over um, so that it can be uploaded this afternoon. If you have any questions or concerns on anything, there is my email address and my phone number. The email address, if you would please, whenever you're sending an email, please put in your subject line that you are a student with questions so that I know and your email stands out that I can readily get to it. And get back to you with any um, questions or concerns. I apologize. Sometimes I find somebody has um, put no subject or has put something in there that I didn't recognize as a student with a question and it went into spam um, and was sitting there for a couple of weeks before I even saw it. So uh, if that's happened to you in the past, my apologies, but I'm going to ask you please put a student with a question in your subject line so that I know to get back to you as fast as I can. Um, so if you have questions or concerns, again, please uh, shoot them over to me. For brevity of time, we tried not to, to do any of that. I um, don't know if we have anything here from the audience or anybody had any questions or concerns that they wanted to type into chat right now um, so that we could, could address any of those. But if you have anything, Please get them over to me and I will try to get back to you um, within the next day or so to help you out. And I, as always, appreciate the opportunity to uh, be able to present to you. Have a great day, folks. Thank you.